opportunities for historic preservation in Shreveport. When the organization Historic Preservation of Shreveport was formed in 1972, many people asked, what buildings are left in Shreveport that are historic? Haven't they all been pulled down? That's a fair question, but we can't begin to answer it until we agree on what makes a building or site historic. To this question, preservationists have come up with several answers, some of which we can use as a basis for deciding what is historic in Shreveport. Just being old is not enough, although that is part of it. A building should tell us something about the people who lived when it was constructed. What sort of people were they? What were their everyday customs? What were they thinking? What were their dreams? And aren't these the things that historians are always trying to find out about past ages? Because we can't really understand ourselves today or plan for the future unless we understand what our forebears thought and did and hoped to do. In general, there are four or five criteria for calling something historic. One is association with a historic event. It can be Independence Hall, Philadelphia, where the Declaration of Independence was signed, or a Dallas street where President Kennedy was assassinated. In the case of Shreveport, it can be the old riverfront warehouses which serve the steamboat trade. Some of them have rather handsome fronts, such as this one which is opposite the site of the old city wharf. Or a 1920s movie in vaudeville theater where an earlier generation swooned over Rudolph Valentino and Greta Garbo. Or the round tower where the first waterworks pumped water from Cross Baya. Another criterion is association with a historic person such as the home of former governor and senator Huey P. Long and his son, Senator Russell Long. Or Talley's Opera House, built in 1871. It was a second-story auditorium on Milam over the present Querbees and Borcan Insurance Agency. There, Shreveporters enjoyed performances by such actors as Maurice Barrymore, father of Lionel, John and Ethel, and Richard Mansfield. Or the simple cottage at 202 McNeil Street, owned in 1867 by a former slave, Amanda Clark. With this and other investments, she made enough to provide a medical education for her son, who later established the Amanda Clark Home for Poor Blacks as a memorial to his mother. Or the municipal auditorium, where many famous musical careers were launched, including those of Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, and Jim Reeves. A building may be historical because of its architectural significance. That can mean stately structures like this antebellum mansion that once stood on Spring Street near Lake. The former federal building, now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Or it can mean unstately structures, like the log dog trot house, such as this one near Keithville. The log dog trot was probably the Upland South's greatest contribution to architecture. It was the uniquely southern home of the large planter as well as the small farmer. Log dog trot houses also served as the homes of the founders of Shreveport. Of all the buildings ever erected in Shreveport, this one was most acclaimed for its design. It was the city incinerator, demolished in 1974. Still another criterion is that of an area which has retained the original overall environment of an earlier period in our history. It can be a row of homes such as these on Buckner Street that were demolished only a few years ago. With a little imagination, you can visualize children on summer evenings rolling hoops down the clay sidewalks or playing croquet in the lawns. Or rows of shotgun houses, such as these on Christian Street. They are homes of laborers who have provided the muscle for building and maintaining our city. Genuine historic preservation should tell the full story of our past, of the mighty, the humble, the noble, and the ignoble. So what do we have left that records our history? What buildings and sites that can serve as visual aids in the study and appreciation of the people who created what we call our hometown? Let's start with our waterfront and the area that grew up around it, what today we call downtown Shreveport. This detail from a bird's eye view drawn over a hundred years ago included many buildings that date from before the Civil War and up into the Reconstruction era. We know that a number of them or parts of them remain today and through research we are discovering more all the time. Let's look at a few. Shreve Square, which fortunately has been saved. City plans of the past called for its demolition. Today it offers an excellent example of a historic area. The east end is near the spot where Kane and Bennett had a trading post for years before there was a Shreveport, even before Captain Shreve arrived. 
Within a short distance of Shreve Square, we find other historic landmarks, such as the old building at 525 Spring Street with cast iron grill work. Built soon after the Civil War, it housed four of our earliest banks, the last of which, the Jacobs Bank, later became First National Bank. The building in the foreground, with elegant iron pilasters and window eyebrows, also dates from the 19th century. This was the home, a century ago, of the Shreveport Times. It is on Spring Street near Milam. This group of store and office buildings on Market Street dates from the late 19th century. The one in the foreground has our only remaining example of the Victorian mansard roof. Here is how it looked when built about 1890 and occupied by Commercial National Bank. This block of early 20th century buildings on Texas Street compares favorably with side streets you could find in Paris or other European cities. There are many, many more such blocks of buildings throughout the downtown area, like those on Louisiana near Milan. It's a good exercise for us to start looking up above the first floors and to discover what Shreveport really has. We talked today about recycling things for modern use. We recycle paper, old beer cans and Coke cans, even the grass cuttings and leaves from our yards. So why not recycle old buildings? The vacant upper floors of many of these could be made into apartments for people who would like to live downtown. Or they could be modernized for professional offices and businesses. We're also fortunate to have some churches of historic importance. One of the oldest is Holy Trinity, built in the 1890s. Its interior is virtually all original, and in the aisles have been installed the side altars from the St. Vincent's Chapel. Antioch Baptist, of the same Romanesque revival style, houses the oldest black congregation in the city. Holy Cross Episcopal, built in 1905, is of Gothic revival style. In its side chapel are preserved the altar, pews, stained glass windows, and cornerstone from the first St. Mark's Church, started before the Civil War. Aguda Thakim Synagogue was included in a New York City exhibit in 1974 as a good example of Art Deco-style architecture. It was built in 1938. What a loss if 100 or 500 years from now we had none of these left to be studied and enjoyed by our grandchildren and their grandchildren as living reminders of Shreveport's history. This detail from that same century-old bird's-eye view of Shreveport shows the area around Oakland Cemetery. The pointers indicate houses still standing today. All are over 100 years old. Oakland Cemetery itself is the resting place for many of our city's founders and a group of Confederate soldiers, as well as many early everyday citizens. Graves can be found like these, dating from the 1850s, and there are said to be a few dating from the 1840s. The Shreveport Beautification Foundation has been instrumental in protecting and restoring this important historic site. Leading from Oakland Cemetery to Texas Avenue is a three-block-long street, formerly a part of Christian Street, and renamed Austin Place. This short street has the greatest concentration of early homes in the city. Even a section of brick sidewalk remains, which you can see in the left foreground. Within its three blocks are four homes over a hundred years old. The Hauser home is probably the oldest, with the rear part dating from just after the Civil War, and the front part from about the 1880s. In the same block are the old St. Mark's Rectory, where the rector, Dr. Dalzell, lived at the time of the yellow fever epidemic of 1873. And the Dr. Austin Cook House, donated by the Comages sisters to historic preservation. Both the rectory and the Dr. Cook House were built about 1870. Near the cemetery is this rooming house, the front part dating from before 1872. It has a simple but elegant classical entrance door, typical of the middle 19th century. Nearby are our two finest examples of gingerbread Victorian. The Ogilvy Wiener Home is now a private club. In the early 1950s, its entertainers included some of the top metropolitan opera and concert musicians. Across the street, this opulent home boasts a hodgepodge of styles, typical of a period of great prosperity in Shreveport. Next door, these worn brick steps lead through an iron gateway to a small house of the same period. At nearby on Oakland Street is this 15-room home, also of the late Victorian era. This is the area that is the primary concern of historic preservation of Shreveport. They hope soon to have it designated as a historic district.
because Austin Place offers our last opportunity to preserve intact a 19th century Shreveport residential street with its trees and lawns as well as its homes. In the Oakland area are some vacant lots which could provide settings for other historic homes which of necessity should be moved. For example, this architectural fantasy on Christian Street with its horseshoe-shaped windows and Juliet balcony. This home at 725 Hope Street, which is typical of Shreveport's earliest frame homes. It is the type which replaced the original log houses of the City Fathers. Opening on the veranda is a classical revival doorway and tall windows to the floor that young people could dance through on warm evenings. Another which could be moved to the Oakland area is this classical revival home in the 900 block of Travis. Repaired and painted, it could hold its own with those seen on many pilgrimages. Scattered throughout Shreveport's older areas are other homes of historic interest. This is another example of the larger gingerbread house at Jordan and Irving Place. The rear part of this one on Kirby probably dates from before the Civil War. On Jordan are numerous examples of the early 20th century neoclassical style to be found through the city. On Highland is this typical California bungalow. And this variation on the same style that was popular before World War I. The smaller version of the style on Rutherford was the childhood home of Van Cliburn. On Louisiana is one of many homes showing beginnings of simplified modern style. Here's the same style after it shed all of its ornament. From the 1920s, we have examples of revivals of many different styles. The Mediterranean, such as this mansion on Jordan. The English Tudor with its half-timber walls. And all sorts of adaptations of classical prototypes. From the 1930s, the international style has left some notable landmarks. There are a number of entire areas in Shreveport which reflect the life of an earlier period. South Highlands, developed before and after World War I. Glen Iris, and of course, Fairfield Avenue. Its settings of live oak trees, flowering shrubs, and romantic gazebos make it as beautiful an avenue as can be found anywhere. Shreveport has a great and colorful past. Much of it is recorded in its buildings and sites which remain today. Historic preservation of Shreveport is dedicated to the task of discovering and saving these for the Shreveporters of today and tomorrow. The late President Truman once said, There is nothing new in the world except the history we don't know. Let's discover the new by learning more about Shreveport's history through preservation.